Well, it all started really way before, uh, around the time when people started thinking about Occupy Wall Street in the first place, uh, which was during the Arab Spring. And we at Waging on Violence were watching this unfold every day. I would wake up and follow Twitter and uh, put on Al Jazeera and watch what was happening in Egypt and in Tunisia. And uh, as this was unfolding, we were we kept asking ourselves, where is this coming from? And so afterward, uh, especially after I was at um, a conference at uh, the Fletcher School put on by ICNC, the International Center on Nonviolent Conflict, um, I started thinking about, okay, uh, if we're going to cover these, these um, struggles, we need to learn about how they're planned. And um, so I started looking for uh, a planning process that I could insert myself in and, uh, and learn about. By uh, early August, I was writing to people who were involved in organizing uh, Occupy Wall Street here in New York, and I was, um, uh, and I was exchanging some emails with them, and then started going to meetings uh, that were taking place by then at Tompkins Square Park uh, in the Lower East Side in East Village um, of New York. And uh, I followed the planning uh, for a few weeks, for I guess uh, a month, a little more than a month before, um, before September 17th, which was almost the entire planning process on the ground at least. And so I got to see uh, the evolution of the group and of their plans and of their intentions and got to meet some of the people who would become leaders on the ground after September 17th when the occupation started. At first I think people didn't really know what to make of me and kept their distance and, and um, uh, you know everyone was still getting to know each other then. Um, but by the time I started publishing articles on waging nonviolence about uh, September 17th, especially in the, in the week before it, before um, almost anybody was paying attention and when anybody who did know about it didn't really know what to think about it, um, then they started to really take an interest in what we were doing um, and what I was doing because I think uh, there was a feeling like you know, I, I understood what was going on a little better than others just because I had been there. And so there was a sense, it seemed to me that that, that was appreciated and um, so those early articles um, became some of the first some of the first coverage that appeared of the movement. Well, I got a little sucked in and, and uh, you know I was spending nights there and I was spending days there and I was um, and I was I, watching this unfold um, and, and especially as the, the actions of the police caused a lot of interest from the outside media, you know I started, talking with some of the people who were doing media relations at the time, which was a, then a very, very small, underdeveloped group. Um, and and uh, though they were working very, very hard um, and, and started talking about how, you know, we could develop media strategies that, um, you know, that would help the movement handle all of this interest from the outside world. And I was especially helped by, um, by some essays that I'd worked on by Mary King, on our site, and she was uh, working on communications for SNCC during the Civil Rights Movement, and her insights really helped me think about how a um, how a, a nonviolent uh, uh, resistance movement should approach its media, and uh, especially approach the outside mainstream media, because at Wall Street they had very very strong independent media. Everyone had a camera. Um, there was the live stream but uh, they weren't so prepared for the mainstream. And so I uh, uh, had a lot of good conversations with people there about how to do that. Um, and then also sometimes uh, uh, mainstream journalists would approach me and ask me um, for help in finding the right people and for the stories that they wanted to do. And so sometimes I was, um, I was doing a little footwork there um, uh, just because of the reporting I had already been doing. Well, I think maybe the thing that was most um, important early on was was the whole issue of demands. I mean, so many people were expecting the structure of a standard protest where where a demand and a message is is designed ahead of time 
and then people hit the streets for a day and then disappear. That wasn't what happened here. Um, like in Spain, like in Egypt, a conscious decision was made to, to craft the demands and craft the messages on the streets as the movement unfolded. And, um, and I think because I was there in the planning process and I understood uh, as best I could what the planners intended and were hoping for, I was just simply able to articulate that um, especially in an FAQ I did at The Nation and also in, um, in articles for Waging Nonviolence. And, um, you know, and I hope that that helped clarify the conversation early on uh, about what these people were after. And also to help to, to, to reveal the ways in which the kinds of plans that were being made in the, at the end of the planning stage and the hopes, really, that these people had for their movement were really fulfilled. Um, by the fact that these assemblies, these general assemblies, were cropping up all over the country. I mean, that was almost more important to a lot of those organizers than uh, meeting some demand of a specific piece of legislation or something like that. Well, I think for me it was a, uh, a reminder that the stories aren't always in the most sens sensationalistic moments of a movement. I mean, as journalists were used to showing up the day of the protest, um, but really I found that some of the most exciting things were the things that happened before that and that happened in the early days after that during the occupation when, when nobody was really sure where this was going, there was a lot of uncertainty, there was a lot of intimidation by the police that just went unreported and those stories were just so powerful and so necessary to understanding what all this really was about. Well, when I was going to the to the planning meetings, I was really excited about what was happening. I wasn't sure where it would go or if it would go anywhere, but I thought it was still a story worth talking about. And so I approached a few editors at uh, mainstream magazines and newspapers and asked if this was something they'd be interested in, that, you know, that all these different uh, 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 demonstrations were being planned at the same time. It just seemed like something was in the air. And at first there wasn't a whole lot of interest. Uh, there wasn't really a place to take the story. Um, and so fortunately I could publish it on Waging Nonviolence and it, there was a place where people could come. And, and then a lot of the sites that republish our work republished it and it started getting out. And, um, and, and you know, that, that became a home for these stories in the meantime. Um, then as this became the story that it became, uh, a lot of those editors came back and we started talking about doing something. And, uh, and, and so I think the fact that I was able to publish that early stuff on the site, you know, created a track record, helped build the story in the first place, but then also led the way toward the work that I've been doing since for other publications as well with larger readerships. So uh, being able to uh, work on the site at first was really valuable to me and really fun and it just fits so perfectly with what we've been trying to do all this time.